All right, welcome back everybody uh, and welcome to day three of the Line Trading Conference. We're super excited to have you guys here with us. Uh, to kick things off, we have an excellent presentation from Jared Tendler, um, who is the author of The Mental Game of Trading and has worked for over 16 plus years with pro poker players, pro golfers, and of course, institutional and retail traders. Uh, Jared, thanks so much for kicking things off today. Yeah, thanks Richard. Uh, good to see you guys and uh, certainly welcome to everybody from around the world uh, who's here. I know some of you are probably up pretty early uh, some of you may be up late uh, on the uh, uh, Western Front here. Um, so yeah, let's uh, kind of dive right in here. Um, what I want to say first off, if if those of you have, haven't already, if you could fill out uh, the survey that's in the chat, uh, I want to involve you all at the beginning of this and uh, we'll get started. Um, so the title you can see is Building a System for Trading Psychology. Uh, that, that idea may sound a little bit new for you. Uh, you know, you have a system for how you trade, how you invest. Question is like, do you have a system for how you actually manage your emotions and are able to deal with them so that they don't uh, cause the kind of problems that are quite costly? And, and so that is a, a bulk of what my work is really about. I consider myself to be a problem solver. And so as we're going through my presentation today, I want you all to be thinking about the big problems that exist in your trading today. And I'm going to try to convince you that a majority of them are actually more uh, emotionally based than you may realize. And I want to say first off, there is a lot of good trading psychology material that is out there. Okay? Uh, the question is though, does it help you to solve the key issues that you're struggling with right in the moment? Because it's one thing to know that you shouldn't really jump into another trade just because uh, you see lots of other people making money uh, or really holding on to a position uh, and not getting out of it uh, at a time when you know you should, right? It's one thing to know that you should have patience and be able to sit on your hands and wait until it hits, hits your target so that you can, or wait until it hits your entry so you can get in. And then of course, patiently waiting until your target to get out. But in the heat of the moment, FOMO can affect you, right? Fear of losing can affect you, uh, anger, confidence, overconfidence, uh, you name it, right? Uh, so being able to trust your gut, being able to be at your best as a trader day in and day out uh, is, is challenging because the live market is so intense and that brings out a lot of the basic weaknesses that you may have, right? And so for a lot of you that have kind of made the transition from sim trading to live trading and have struggled, right? That's a big reason, right? Because in the live market, your emotions come out because your goals are on the line, your money is on the line, right? Your future is on the line, everything you care about in in this endeavor is on the line. So yeah, it's going to be intense, much like it is intense for athletes to compete at the highest level, right? Those playing in the British Open right now, right? It is intense to be in those uh, those positions. So what's, what's natural to come out are your weaknesses. So the big question is, right, do you have a system, right? A strategy to actually be able to address and manage those on a day in and day out basis. And so I have been in the trenches with elite traders from institutional firms, with the traders and investors, just like all of you for the last nine years now, right? And I know what it takes to actually develop and cultivate that right mindset, that right mentality uh, to be able to trade and invest in the way that you all know that you want, you want to, right? You, you do not want to be the cause of your losses. You do not want to be the cause of what uh, many would define as kind of underperforming or not really fulfilling your potential or not really being able to transition out of that day job that you uh, so desperately want to get out of, right? And so what I'm going to provide you today is, is a primer on how to begin doing that, okay? Right? Your trading system or strategy is designed to find those high probability opportunities, right? And my system is going to help you to understand when it becomes a lot more likely that you're going to do something stupid, okay? And that's the thing you want to avoid the most. Okay, so before I dive in here, uh, I posted that, uh, so that the survey has been posted in the chat. Uh, let's look at specifically uh, uh, where this comes from here. So back in November, I completed a trading psychology survey with a number of different trading entities, uh, Trader Line included. And we were able to get over 1,200 uh, respondents to the survey. And you'll see that there are uh, a wide stratification of, of uh, people from around the world, different ages. Uh, and also, uh, you know, fairly stratified among among gender. Now, the 
uh, results that I'm going to uh, show you in a second here, they hold up across demographics. Okay, so pretty much everybody is struggling in the same general uh, pattern here. Uh, and so first off, uh, you know, and these are the exact same questions that you all answered. Uh, all right. So uh, first off, how many of you believe that trading psychology uh, plays an important role in trading? Okay, 96% uh, in the survey results that I, I conducted uh, said uh, that they believe that that's the case. Uh, and I'll show you uh, the results of people in the room here in a second. Uh, number two, uh, how many of you right, can see when emotions affect trading their actual trading decisions? And slight dip, but still 91%. Still a large majority of traders are able to do that. Here's the kicker, okay? How many of you all have a concrete strategy for managing your emotions, right? In the survey results, 34%, we're talking about a 57 point gap, right? You're aware that it matters, you're, you can see it, but do you, can you actually deal with it in real time? And the answer for, the, for a, a vast many of traders is no. Let's see what the results are in the room here. I'm just gonna refresh SurveyMonkey and see where we land. Okay, 100, oh, not quite 100%, 98.67% of you out of 75, right? Believe that psychology plays an important role. How many of you can see it in real time? 90%, okay, so basically we're, 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 we're holding pretty true here. And if we get down here, only 21% of you uh, agree that you have a concrete strategy, right? So those in the agree or neither agree nor disagree, to me, that's that answer is no, right? You don't have it yet because you either do or you don't. It's, it's fairly binary. Uh, so the vast majority of you are really in the exact same boat uh, as the majority of the traders that have been surveyed. And so this is the big pattern that I had noticed, you know, when I kind of entered the trading psychology field uh, a number of years ago. So uh, before we, I kind of dive kind of too deep into the system, I just I do want to kind of point out one more thing about my background uh, that I think is really important. It's really about this system. OK, so I've been coaching for over 17 years now. Right. I have clients in 45 countries. Richard mentioned PGA Tour players, some of the top poker players in the world. Right. I don't have anybody at this year's main event final table. They're down to the final three here playing for 10 million. Uh, but I've had a number of players uh, over the years at the main event final table win bracelets, win some of the biggest poker tournaments in the world. Uh, I've also uh, been involved with sports bettors. Uh, one of the, you know, somebody in Australia making a million dollars a year uh, betting on horses. Uh, I've worked with MMA fighters. I've worked with a radiologist. I've worked with uh, eSport athletes, worked with Team Liquid for four years, uh, coaching uh, their players and won numerous championships. And the reason I'm pointing this out is that the system that I'm talking about with you today has been honed and systematized across all of these different environments. And it's not because I know, you know as much about all those different environments. It's that the system right, is universal. It, it based, it, it's kind of based off of how you know, the, the, the brain works and how human beings operate. And so today we're going to go through the system. Uh, I'm going to give you some things that you're going to be able to actually uh, take away and use on Monday, or if you trade crypto or tr trade futures, right? Trade immediately. It's, it's, this is going to help you immediately to begin to address those big mistakes that are costing you a lot of money. All right. So let's get into this. Now, the biggest problem that I see with traders is not the greed, not the FOMO, not the anger, the discipline problems, the confidence problems. The biggest problem that I see is that your, your approach to problem solving is actually backwards, right? It's the way that you're thinking about solving these mental game problems that's actually the problem, right? Many of you think that emotions are the problem when emotions are not the problem, right? So in order to actually be able to solve the fear and the greed and the FOMO and the anger, right? You need to understand what's causing it, right? Much like a weed, right? If you're going to pull a weed out, you've got to get the roots. You don't get the roots, the sucker's going to grow back. And that's what has happened for many of you, right? You've made attempts to solve all of those issues and they may work for a short time. Kind of turns out to be like a placebo effect, right? You're taking a sugar pill thinking it's actually, you know, curing you of some illness and it's not. It's just a temporary reprieve and the thing just kind of grows back. So number one, if you're going to actually solve these problems, you got to begin to change your thinking about them. And that's what the first chunk of my presentation uh, is really designed to do, okay? Now, I'm going to say this again and again, okay? Emotions are not the problem, right? Emotions cause problems, right? That's why we're all here. That's why you're here, okay? 
but they're more of a signal of what's actually the problem, right? And it's a signal of the underlying flaws and biases and illusions or wishes or hopes that are ultimately skewing your perspective about what you're trying to accomplish. And that is the real problem, okay? So once your, your mind makes this shift, then the entire game changes, right? And then it becomes not about trying to control your emotions, right? Controlling your emotions is at best a temporary solution, right? If you break your ankle, a cast is a phenomenal temporary solution, but you don't want to just keep walking around with a cast after your ankle heals. Like that doesn't make any sense. And so many of you that are relying on control as the long-term solution are basically walking around with a cast on your ankle, but now you're actually trying to play in the British Open, or you're trying to play against the best traders in the world, you know, effectively kind of handicapping yourself. So the real strategy in my mind, right, and, and the purpose of my system is to get you to actually solve the problem, pull the weed out by its roots, and then the sucker goes away, right? I'm not saying that the emotions go away as if you become robotic and numb or neutral, but instead your emotions become more pure. They become more of a reflection of what's going on in the market, right? Where, where you can actually kind of tap into your intuition. So excitement may show up as real kind of intuitive sense that there's big opportunity for you or fear is real intuitive sense that your positions are, uh, you know, in a compromised spot or the market is regime is changing and you need to be a bit more worried about what's going on. That kind of purity allows you to use your emotions as a tool. Right now, though, your emotions get more compromised by those biases, by those illusions, by those wishes that you are imprinting into the price action, into the market. That's the stuff that we're trying to clean out, clear out, so you can be a better version of yourself, be a better trader for yourself. Right? And that is ultimately what the system is trying to accomplish. Okay, so just to kind of further drive home this change in perspective, here are a couple more critical points. That not a lot of people know, let alone traders, okay? So here we go. Number one, emotional control is a mental process. And that part of the brain has a limited capacity, okay? So hear me out here. The part of the brain when you actually have a thought, okay, you're thinking in your head, uh, that's called working memory. Working memory has a limited amount of space between five and nine pieces of information. The average is seven, okay? So you get seven pieces of data. Imagine them like puzzle pieces, okay? Seven pieces of data you can hold in your mind at one time. Well, guess what? Emotional control is one of those pieces. So when you're trying to uh, weigh a decision, right, and you're looking at your different indicators and you're uh, perceiving what's going on in the market, if you have to spend some of those puzzle pieces, some of that mental resource trying to be aware of, right, your emotions, and then having to control them, Right? You're pulling mental capacity like kind of off the table. So it becomes fundamentally impossible for you to trade as well as you possibly can in those moments because you do not have the bandwidth to be able to do that because you've segmented out part of your mental capacity for emotional control and being aware of those emotions. So it's like you're going to be trying to be, be like a, a, a bouncer at a bar. <laughs> well, at the same time, where you've got to actually be the one, you know, kind of taking, taking care of it. So it's, it just becomes uh, a, a, a misallocation of resources when the alternative is doing a bit more work in advance to better understand what's really causing your emotions so that you can solve them and work through them. Um, and, and frankly, like when you do this, I have uh, one client in particular who was a swing trader because he could not mentally and emotionally handle day trading. It was just too emotionally volatile for him. And when he went through this process, was able to start day trading as a result of a lot of that emotionality, a lot of that emotional volatility getting cleared out. All right. Number two, the other reason you don't want to rely on emotional control because emotions are more powerful than the mind. So that part of the brain I was just talking about can get shut down by your emotions, right? So here we're talking about uh, you know, the prefrontal cortex, just to give you uh, a, a little bit of brain knowledge there. The prefrontal cortex 
is a part of the frontal lobe. And, and in this region of the brain is where you think, where you plan, where you make decisions, uh, where you kind of weigh different pieces of information. And it's cool when your emotions are easier. Like there's more kind of flatlined uh, or a kind of in a, in, just in a better spot. You know, you're able to access full capacity there. But when your emotions start to rise, they actually can have the power to shut down that part of the brain. So that five to nine number, let's again, go back to the average of seven, will shrink to five. So now you've got five pieces of information you can weigh. Two of them are being devoted towards being aware and controlling your emotions. Now you're down to three. So from seven to three, again, you cannot uh, trade as well as you possibly can given that dynamic. And the problem gets even worse because your emotions can get so intense where they shut off that part of the brain entirely. And you all have experienced that, right? Whether it be in trading or elsewhere, where you've been so angry, you're in like a blind rage, or you're so greedy, you're in like a blind euphoric state where you just think nothing can go wrong. And of course, this trade is going to make uh, your entire career. It's going to be like winning the lottery. Or you're in a blind panic where you're so paralyzed, you're like a deer in headlights, and you can't do anything, right? And you're either stuck in this position or you can't get into one that you know would be a monster. So in that spot, you're, that frontal part of the brain has completely shut down. You cannot even come close to controlling your emotions in that spot because emotional control is a mental process and emotions are more powerful than that. So those are two basic fundamentals of how the brain works. And so if you're going to develop a strategy, you must, you must take those things into consideration, right? Because otherwise your strategy is going to be, de is, is going to basically fail just because of that. And many of you unfortunately have been in this situation where, where you've sort of unknowingly thought that what you were doing was right. Your emotions steamroll you. And then of course, what happens? Then you get pissed off or fearful or lose confidence because you sort of failed in that spot and you think it's down to you or the way that you're working. And it's not, if you're not accounting for these fundamental realities of how the brain works, it's like not playing by the rules of the game, right? Not, in this case, you don't even know the rules of the game. Okay. So we've all been there, right? Emotional control is a great short-term strategy, but it is not a long-term one, right? I'm going to provide you the framework for how to actually get there. And again, the good news is once you understand these basic realities of how the brain works, right? It doesn't, make everything easier, okay? But it does give you a sense of, uh, you know, practicality for how to actually progressively work through this. Because when I think about like the mental game, and either, I really like the term mental game because it does imply the dynamic nature of this, right? That there's rules, there's strategy that has to be developed. And, you know, much like going to the gym, right? You could hear a presentation from a personal trainer and, it all could make sense. Does that give you muscles? <laughs> no, you actually got to get into the gym and do the work. So what I'm going to provide you today is not going to be the thing that's going to actually change everything for you, unless it does that first thing that I mentioned, which is change your perspective. That can happen instantaneously. And that I do hope will happen today. But at the end of the day, you've got to do the work. And the cool thing about that is that when you do the work, you will see more results. And when you see more results, you'll feel a sense of, uh, of optimism towards solving these problems that may have been around for quite a long time, okay? And I can tell you that from the clients that I've worked with over the years, from the people that have, you know, read my book or uh, gone to the Trader Line Masterclass, the uh, master, uh, Trading Psychology Masterclass, you can see the optimism and the hope, even if the problems haven't been solved yet. Just knowing that you're on a path, knowing that you're on a road that is different from where you were before, you know, can really change a lot and actually remove a chunk of emotions. All right. So let's keep going on here. Uh, so now that you understand why you cannot rely on emotional control and why your goal needs to be identifying and correcting the cause of your emotions, let's start actually doing that. Okay. So whether you have realized it or not, the costly or repetitive mistakes that you make, right, the mistakes that you know better than not to make are not a consequence of your lack of skill or experience, they are caused by your emotions, okay? And we know that because 
you don't need to learn anything more about trading. You don't need to improve anything with your terms of your indicators or your system or your strategy to get better in those spots. Of course, we can always get better. And I, I would want you to do that. But in, in, this, in, in these situations, right, the FOMO, the greed, the anger, right, you know that when you lose, you know, two trades in a row, you should not triple down on the third. And yet you do in that moment. And you might even be aware in the moment that you shouldn't do that. But I hope you now understand, right, that being aware that what you're doing is wrong in the moment, right, is a consequence of that emotionality being too high. And that actually can be one of the worst spots to be in. It's kind of like you're 80% of the way towards that blue screen where your emotions have completely compromised you, right? But you're now in the spot where you're aware that what you're doing is wrong, and yet you cannot stop yourself. And that can cause a lot of, you know, fear and anger, over, uh, loss of confidence when you can, you know, feel like you're just like kind of self-sabotaging yourself and undercutting yourself. Like, why, why would you possibly do that? And it's not, you are not the problem again. It's your perspective that's the problem. You are just kind of being paralyzed in those moments because the emotions are high enough. And so what happens in those moments is that you make those mistakes that you know you ought not to make. Okay. So once you understand that, the goal becomes less around trying to gain control in the moment. And now it ought to be trying to understand what the heck is happening. Why have your emotions gotten so intense? What is causing them? Right? Those are questions that you want to begin to ask yourself in those spots. Now, the good thing is, and I know maybe some of you may not think of this as a good thing, but I think of it as a good thing because it's helpful. The good thing is that these mistakes happen in repetitive patterns. Okay, so much like the patterns that you see in the market that are providing you the opportunity to make profit, your mistakes happen in repetitive patterns. And so, yes, on the one hand, that can be immensely infuriating, right? It's that Einstein quote, right? Uh, the definition of, ins of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Why the heck am I doing this thinking that something else is going to happen? It's like, again, you, you've lost control. You're not consciously choosing to do this, right? You're just sort of relying on your instincts in that moment. And your instincts are telling you, yeah, this is a good opportunity, right? I should, you know, kind of FOMO in and that makes sense. In the moment, it makes sense, right? Yes, of course, I should triple down on this position, right? Uh, it makes sense in the moment, but because they happen in repetitive patterns, it gives you the opportunity to actually better understand what has happened. So you can begin to study your pattern, right? And actually learn uh, the different ways in which it shows up and that can give you the opportunity for foresight, right? Right now, too many of you are relying on hindsight. You know retroactively, you know, that you shouldn't have done that, but you can't necessarily predict that it's going to happen. And so, again, it's the exact same thing with trading, right? You may be able to see where the profit was, you know, in backtesting or in hindsight, but can you actually take the trades? Can you actually see the mental game problems in advance? That is where, what you were working towards. That is what my system is designed to help you to do, okay? And that outcome is possible. The really the question is kind of like, how long is it gonna take you to get there, okay? Now, again, uh, this is probably repetitive at this point already, right? Emotions are more powerful. They're powerful enough to compel you to make mistakes if you are blind to their presence, okay? So the, the place where we begin here uh, is in starting to actually uh, learn where your psychology, where your emotions uh, are causing those costly mistakes. And I, I can, I mean, I guarantee all of you, you just think about how much those mistakes cost you, not on a daily basis, because on a daily basis, I mean, unless you're like blowing out accounts regularly, right? It's, it can be more of a slow bleed, but think about it week over week, month over month, or the next 12 months, how much are these things actually costing you? And how much of your time would you be willing to invest to solve them? How much of your capital would you be willing to invest to solve them? And my guess is uh, all of you would be uh, quite happy to do that. All right. So uh, as we begin looking closer at the emotions causing your costly mis and repetitive mistakes, uh, let's look at the big five, in my mind, uh, psychology, uh, psychological problems that pretty much every trader uh, experiences to some degree or another or have at some point in their career. All right, the first one, uh, everybody's favorite, greed. So in my mind, greed is a problem, but not in the same way that maybe you all think of it. 
right? The greed fear index is a great popular kind of heuristic that you might see in the media, but it is really pretty bad in terms of actually helping traders, helping investors to better understand what's going on with their emotions. Because if we look at greed, what the heck is behind it, right? Greed is basically your desire to make more money, but that's kind of your job. So what the heck's the problem here, right? Your job is to make money. Not a single person on the planet would say that Tiger Woods, that Rafa Nadal, that any of the elite athletes that exist in the world, that they're greedy for wanting to win more, right? You know, trying to win more championships. Look, what? It doesn't even make any sense. How could that be greed? And yet greed does exist in all competitive environments because it, in my mind, kind of draws that line between your attempts at winning kind of cross this line where you're now actually making decisions, uh, making plays, doing things that are actually going to lower your chances of success. Okay. So the trouble with greed is that there's nobody who can observe you trading and say, oh, you're, you're being greedy. Because they don't know your system or strategy well enough to know where that line is. You have to make the determination where your ambition crosses that line and now it's actually greedy and then has a, has a greater than likelihood chance of costing. Now, the funny thing is, right, in trading, right, greed is not always going to punish you. And sometimes those false positives where your greedy attempts to make more money actually pays off, cost you more in the long run. Because now you think that uh, that is the line and that behavior is going to get punished in the future and can cause some pretty big drawdowns, pretty big losses. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard many of traders who've experienced that, uh, if not yourself. So again, greed is really not necessarily a problem in and of itself. It's more of a question of what is going to compel your ambition to get so outsized that it's going to actually going to cost you money. And in my experience, my research, it's really more about fear and anger, overconfidence, loss of confidence that really is kind of compelling you to cross that line. So I say greed is, is a real issue because you can kind of map it and you can chart it and you can become more aware of where it's occurring. But when it comes down to actually solving it, we've got to think about it more in those other buckets, which I'm going to get to here in a minute. Uh, okay. So fear. Fear in trading is overblown. Um, again, I think that fear, greed, that greed, fear index, you know, kind of makes fear out to be a bigger problem uh, in the trading world than it is. Uh, now I got my start in poker uh, in 2008 and I was coming from the golf world and I, you know, I played poker as a kid and kind of knew, but you know, there's a big difference between that and, you know, some of the best players in the world. And when I came to poker, what I found was that anger was a far bigger issue uh, than it was, uh, it was anything else. In, in trading, what I found is that fear seems to be the far bigger issue uh, in terms of all the mental game issues. And, and the research that I talked about from November actually confirmed that. Now, I do think, though, that the fear is overblown because the barriers to entry to get into trading are very, very minimal. I mean, literally, you have money and you can trade. What are the barriers to entry to play in the NFL or the English Premier League or, you know, in the British Open? I mean, the barriers to entry are massive, right? You have to develop skills over a long period of time. Whereas a trader, it's like, no, I've got, I've got 10K. Look, let me go trade today with the best traders in the world thinking that I can do it. And so, yeah, there might be some overconfidence early on, but typically kind of as that overconfidence wanes, many traders start to get into a position, especially uh, you know, when they're, we're in the trading on the live market early on, where the normal nerves of competing in a highly intense environment get misconstrued as being fear, when they're just sort of the normal nerves. Like if you were not fearing, uh, feeling that intensity, then that actually would be a bigger problem, right? I mean, there's not a single PGA Tour player on the planet who does not feel nerves stepping on the first tee of a tournament. And frankly, actually, when they do, that's an indication that they should retire because it's like, I don't, they don't care anymore. You care. Your freaking money's on the line. Your career is on the line. Your future's on the line. So yeah, trading is going to be intense. But let's not mistake that intensity for fear, right? Fear is really a bigger issue. So a lot of you just need to get better at dealing with those inherent nerves. The second thing is that many of you actually have some big gaping holes in your strategy or your system. 
right? If I were to ask you right now, tell me what your strategy is. You've got two minutes. Go. In fact, I did this with a client the other day, right? And he actually gave a great answer. And then we stepped back and it was like, yeah, but you missed like, you, you said nothing about what your exit strategies were. You said nothing about kind of your pre-market prep and what that looks like and how you're actually looking. For, it was like, holy crap. And it was eye-opening for him to actually see that, right? So can you provide that answer cold? Because I'll tell you what, the traders with eight to 10, 12, sometimes five years of experience, they can tell it to you like it's the back of their hand. And so if you don't have that, you are going to experience more fear, more nervousness, just because you're not as solid, right? Fear at its core really comes down to uncertainty. It's a bigger conversation. If you want more, go to, the, go to, my, go to my book. But just trust me for now, right? Fear is more about uncertainty, right? Because if you think about it, the antidote to fear is certainty. If you have 100% certainty about what is going to happen, there's nothing to fear, okay? You might not like it, especially if it's something mega, but there's nothing to fear. So but when you have more holes in your strategy, there's just more inherent uncertainty about how you make money, how you're going to profit from the market, and especially if the market's changing. So those two big reasons, I believe, are why fear gets overblown, okay? But then, of course, there are legitimate fear of loss, fear of mistakes, uh, fear of losing, uh, I guess fear of loss, uh, fear of failing, sometimes fear of success, and oh yeah, right, FOMO, right, fear of missing out. By and large, FOMO is not, it does not come down to fear. You don't actually fear like you're, like you're scared that you're going to miss out on an opportunity. More often than not, it's about greed, right? You cannot live with yourself if you uh, miss that opportunity. Sometimes it's about anger. You get pissed off at yourself if you miss that opportunity. Sometimes it's about a loss of confidence. You lose confidence. Oh, everybody else is making money, but I'm not, right? It's, it, FOMO is kind of a big umbrella, almost like greed is. It's not really about fear. Again, for some of you, it is, right? The fear that you're actually going to miss out an opportunity because maybe you're trading on the side. And so there are only so many opportunities or, you know, maybe you're, you're fearing because you're just a trader that doesn't get many opportunities. Your strategy only maybe has three to five opportunities a week and that may be fine. But so you might be really nervous and fearful that you're going to maybe, you know, go to the bathroom when <laughs> an entry might pop up or like, you know, and that's, that would be fine. But for the most part, FOMO is not uh, really about fear. All right. So tilt, I mentioned tilts right in poker um, or mentioned anger, right? The, the term in poker is tilt. And the term comes from pinball where people would get so pissed off that they would tilt the pinball machine to try to save the ball from going down. And so to me, right. Tilt is kind of a, just a fun term. If you're going to have an anger issue. Let's have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, but the bottom line is, right, there's a lot of things in trading to get angry at, right? You can get angry at losing, you get angry at your mistakes, right? You can get angry at the market, maybe have a little bit of revenge. You can have anger where you feel like you're in, you know, you're just kind of constantly getting unlucky, uh, what I call injustice tilt. Uh, entitlement tilt, you know, more of a bigger issue in, in poker. Those of you that know Phil Helmuth is kind of the poster child for uh, entitlement tilt there. But entitlement tilt really is, is more about a, of a confidence issue. Uh, and so let's get into confidence, right? Now, confidence by and large, right? We're talking about overconfidence where you're thinking too highly of yourself, your system, uh, you're, you're kind of predicting, right? What's going to come. Like, you know, that this is uh, going to pay off, even though you kind of know that you can't know that, but you know that you think you should, shouldn't. It's just overconfidence is really just kind of predicting the future uh, in, in a way that's not real or, or overvaluing your current skill set or your, uh, your strategy. Uh, lacking confidence, obviously, is the opposite of that. The, the ironic thing about confidence is that uh, you can be a new trader with a ton of confidence and a very experienced trader who is way, way better than that newer trader and yet have much less uh, belief or confidence in your, your strategy or your abilities as a trader, which is kind of not how it should be, which is why confidence is a problem, right? Confidence should be a direct reflection of your competence, right? Your actual skill as a trader or your confidence in your system, right? But the, the way in which that perception of your skill gets off is what defines being overconfident or uh, lacking confidence, okay? And that misperception really comes down again to those flaws, the biases, the illusions. Now I'll, I'll get to some examples of those in a minute, right? That really are the cause of not just your 
you know, kind of oscillation and confidence, but also, you know, the other uh, emotions that I mentioned. Now, one of the biggest flaws that exist in trading is being overly focused on PL, being overly focused on results, being overly focused on your account balance. Well, what happens, right? You end up going through a roller coaster of overconfidence and underconfidence based on how you're doing. You win two trades today, flying high. Of course, you're going to be a little bit looser with your parameters. And so that third one is in not the greatest trade, it loses. And then all of a sudden, your, your confidence goes in the crapper, right? It just goes up and down because, again, right, you're so focused on having your perception of your skill be defined by your PL. Not how it works, man. Like you, you, you all are creating more emotional volatility when you, you know, kind of too closely attach, right, your confidence to your results. And on some level, that makes sense because how else are you going to define yourself? It's like money is sort of the scoreboard here. Well, there are some tools that you can use. Uh, there's one I'll, uh, maybe I'll get to later uh, for how you can begin doing that. But at a, at a minimum, if you can begin to focus more on your skill and your execution, right, that's sort of an, an easier antidote uh, to uh, focusing too much on results and having your confidence get a little bit more stable uh, and consistent. Now, the last problem is the one that I think traders tend to think of most when they have mental game or trading psychology uh, errors here, which is discipline. And discipline is a real problem, right? You can, you know, struggle with boredom, uh, laziness, procrastination, uh, distractibility. Uh, you know, of course, you can be a little bit too loose, right, at times in your execution. Uh, but by and large, discipline issues that you all think you have are really caused by any of those four other emotions compelling you, right, to violate your strategy, your system, your rules, whether that be actual trading decisions or even, you know, your pre-market prep or your uh, post-market uh, wrap-up. You know, those weaknesses that exist at any points in your strategy system operations or your trading operation, like think of it like as a business, right, with the, the looseness in that, yes, it can be down to some weaknesses uh, that maybe we would define more of, of like a mental strength kind of thing, right? Training yourself to adhere to a system. And yes, that is real. Much like a golfer has to train his golf swing. Yeah, many of you do have to actually train the procedure, train the system with which you are ascribing to. And yeah, that gets a little bit harder when your maybe energy is a little bit low, you're a little bit tired, you're a little bit lazy, right? Okay, fine. But more often than not, the mistakes that I hear about that are kind of defined under this umbrella of uh, discipline or lack thereof is really about, oh no, I violated it because of FOMO, I violated it because of greed or anger, right? It's more the emotions that are kind of driving and compelling that. Okay, so I've talked about this a bunch, right? Uh, what are some uh, examples of uh, the hidden problems that exist, right? The flaws, the biases, the illusions, right? These are the roots of the weed, right? This is what we are trying to pull out. Now in the mental game of trading, I write about maybe 40 of these guys and I'm not being comprehensive in, you know, the trading psychology masterclass, we get to a lot more of these, uh, but I want to give you some idea of what we're talking about here. Uh, so uh, expecting uh, perfection is by far one of the biggest issues that I see with traders, right? Many of you are high achievers. Uh, many of you have been successful in other arenas. And so you're, you just expect a lot of yourself. And those expectations in and of themselves are not a problem, okay? They are a driver of your success. But by and large, I've seen this sort of flaw emerge because it's great for motivation, but it's really, really rough for fear and anger and confidence, okay? And it can cause all of those things. So, you know, again, in and of itself, not a problem, but uh, when you expect perfection, right, you fall short of it, all of those emotions, that emotional volatility is going to come out uh, quite dramatically. And the question is, is that actually helping you to climb as a trader? And, and from my experience, the answer is maybe, but it's at least slowing it down because there's so many ups and downs that get created. And there is a better way of doing it where you can kind of have the best of the upside uh, without having to tolerate as much of the downside. Uh, the illusion of control. Right. Basically, you know, you think that you're in more control of your results in the short term than you actually are. Like for many of you, I mean, trading might be the first instance where you're dealing with a highly volatile short term kind of feedback mechanism. Like you're doing all the right things and losing money. Like where in life does that really happen at such high concentration as it does in trading? 
it happens that way in poker, which is why for me, the transition from poker to trading was, was quite natural. Like, yeah, I kind of get all this stuff. And, and what's been cool is that, you know, talking with golfers now, really helping them to understand the amount of luck that exists in that game, right. And getting them kind of bought in. It's like, you don't have full control. You hit the shot. It's out of your hands. Now the wind's going to blow bag bounces, right? Same thing with the trade, right? Your job is to execute to the best of your ability based on your strategies, your system and the short-term results, they ain't in your control. And if you try to out comes a lot more emotional volatility, uh, expecting to make money from every trade or every day. Like, I mean, some of you see the like elite of the elite who are just seemingly like turning on a printing press and just making money every day. And yeah, I, I do know that there are a few people out there that are doing that. But some of them are actually, you know, maybe not, okay, I'm not going to get into that. Bottom line is, if you expect this, right, uh, in the back of your mind, sometimes it resides. Many of you might not admit to actually believing this consciously because you might know that it's not practical, especially given the certain uh, strategies that you're, you're trading. Um, but if somewhere deep, in down, deep down you believe that, right, what's going to happen when you lose? You're going to overreact to it, and then you're imprinting bias in the market and you're going to see things that aren't there. You're going to, you're going to think that are op- there are opportunities. And you're going to think that it's your gut that's saying, yes, we should jump in right now and double double size. When, you know, in hindsight, you're going to realize that's obviously not the case. Um, hating luck. Right? So now we're taking the element of variance, that element of luck, and expanding out to something that you actually hate. Right? And that that is really not usually about the hating of the luck. It's that you hate the emotional volatility that comes as a result of that. And you hate the mistakes that you make as a result of that. You don't really hate the luck, right? You need to embrace it, right? All right? Why would you hate the rules of a game? Don't play the game if that's the case, if you really actually do hate it. Uh, black and white thinking, uh, one of those kind of that ri- resides in the deep recess of the mind. If you are one that kind of defines yourself as either amazing or garbage, right? Have these very kind of binary ways of seeing the market, seeing opportunities, seeing yourself, see other traders, Right, the sort of black or white thinking can really, again, cause a lot of emotional volatility because it's there are a lot more gray in reality. And we want stability in the way that you're perceiving yourself uh, and uh, the market. Okay. And at the end of the day, right, I want you to begin treating the thoughts and the emotions that you're experiencing not as the problem. I want you to start getting curious about what's what's sort of showing up because they're an indication of the real problem, right? These hidden performance, flaws, illusions, biases, hopes, right? Wishing that you could make easy money, right? Would be another example of uh, one of these flaws. All right. So trading psychology system. I want to give you just sort of the four four steps to this, okay? Uh, If you want more, right? Mental game of trading goes into very precise detail. The trading psychology masterclass with Trader Line, right? Goes into even more detail. We got 12 hours over five webinars where I'm kind of pouring through lots of examples uh, and, and lots of anecdotes, lots of stories around, um, you know, each of these uh, steps. All right. So number one is called mapping your pattern. We're actually going to do this today. Like I said, I want to have, I want you to have something tangible that you can do uh, immediately. Uh, number two is getting to the root of your problem, right? Dig out those underlying performance flaws, biases, right? And I've got tools that can help you to do that. Uh, number three is to correct your problem. So, once you can train yourself to have the vision to see it in real time, right, which comes from mapping the pattern, once you then understand what's forcing that, what's causing that in the moment, you can develop a strategy to help to contain it in real time early before your emotions get too big, before the problems get too big, right, and, and be able to actually prevent those mistakes from occurring. I mean, that's, that's what this is all about, right, and eventually get to the point where those problems are actually solved, right? FOMO is not a problem for everybody, right? Greed and anger, right? Not a problem for every trader, right? So you can get to a point where your emotions are stable enough where, you know, really they can become clean and more reflective of what is actually happening versus what you think or wish or perceive them to be happening. Uh, And the fourth step is kind of a fun one because it's just repeat and adapt. The system that I, I've developed, right, again, is apl- applicable across all these different contexts. And it's also applicable throughout your trading career. You're not just learning a strategy that can help you now. Right? I'm not going to just kind of teach you how to fish. I'm sorry. I mean, I am going to teach you how to fish. I'm not going to teach you. I'm not just going to give you fish. I'm going to teach you how to fish. 
that's what the system is really all about. So, you know, as you continue to evolve as a trader, there's always going to be something you can fix, right? No, no trader is perfect. Everyone has a proverbial C game uh, as part of their, their competence. And so this system can kind of go with you along the way uh, throughout the entirety of your trading career. Okay. Uh, so the first step here is uh, basically collecting data around each of your trading mistakes. Okay. So at this point, you should have a couple of them clearly in mind. Okay. And so when they happen, these are some examples of the kinds of data that you can collect in real time and then be able to uh, kind of better understand, you know, kind of the full scope of what's going on so that eventually you can map that pattern, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay. So the instrument of the situation, what's the trigger, right? What's actually causing the emotion. Okay. The thoughts that are occurring, this is really important because those thoughts can become so uh, reflective of those underlying flaws, right? Probably one of the best things you can do is just like actually write out, you know, what you're thinking about in the moment uh, when these mistakes occur. Okay. And again, I'll give you some examples here. Um, what are the emotions? Uh, what are the behaviors, actions, mistakes that you make? Sometimes these can get a little bit confusing. Uh, again, some people have different thoughts about what these can mean. For me, the behaviors kind of tend to be more about like kind of internal uh, or external like actions, right? So you might like kind of slam your hand down on the desk or punch the monitor, uh, or maybe you, uh, you know, kind of get hyper-focused uh, on, uh, you know, one chart or another. Uh, maybe you kind of feel like heat in your head or uh, nervousness in your stomach, right? And then actions, uh, you know, would be actually maybe more examples of the ones I just mentioned where, you know, you're kind of slamming your hand down, uh, hyper-focusing, uh, you know, uh, and of course then, you know, kind of capturing the actual mistake that you're making too. Uh, change in decision-making, change in market perception. Basically here you're trying to get into like from a more technical standpoint, uh, how are you now maybe thinking about a particular indicator in the wrong way or failing to even consider it? You know, effectively kind of how does your perception of the market or your strategy start to alter? Okay, here's an example. Okay, bought Apple, got stepped out by a tick, right? The thought is I can't believe this is happening again. And so I want revenge. I'm going to get hyper-focused on finding a new entry, and then maybe I'll take them several times repeatedly. Uh, then I get overly focused on getting my money back. That's the change in the decision-making. The decision is not about taking an optimal setup. The decision now is based on getting my money back. Okay, mark The change in market perception, now I'm reading too much into price action, basically like looking for an, an entry rather than the entry kind of coming to me. All right, uh, one more example, opening bell seeing stocks make a move out of the gate. The thought is I need to get involved and make money. Let's get a quick trade off the bat uh, and get a winner under the belt. Uh, the emotion is the sort of hasty nervousness behavior, right? There's a heart racing, closely monitoring price action, staring at the spread, not sticking to initial plan, quickly booking profit to avoid turning, uh, it, avoid it turning into a loser, uh, change in decision-making, watching ticks instead of executing my plan. And the change of perception, not looking at chart structure with an, ob uh, with an objective mind, letting my focus on making money skew my judgment. All right. So my advice here is that you take this worksheet, which you can get from my website, and I'll show you where to get that in a minute, and print it out. Or you don't even need the worksheet. Just write down these things while you are actually trading. The interesting thing is that actually doing that for some of you can help to disrupt the momentum of that pattern. Like I said, these mistakes happen in repetitive patterns, right? What's the first law, you know, uh, Einstein's first law or Newton's first law of motion, right? Object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an outside force. These mistakes are so ingrained, right? That they're going to naturally go to their conclusion if the conditions in the market are ripe, unless you become the force to act against it. So taking down this data in real time can, is like just a very easy way to kind of disrupt that pattern and to create a bit more objectivity, a bit more awareness of what's happening, right? That's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, you're capturing the data that is going to help you to build a strategy, better understand why you are reacting this way. And it really helps to feed that second step of the system, right? Getting to the root of your problem. 
All right, so a couple other tips uh, for collecting data. Number one, uh, looking for early signals, okay? For, for some of you right now, you don't, you don't see the anger, the FOMO, the loss of confidence, the overconfidence until after the mistakes have already happened. But I promise you this, there are signals that are occurring far before that. You're just not aware of them right, yet. But just keep asking yourself the question, especially if a mistake happens. You might even take a five minute break from trading as you make one and really step back and see how, like how far back can you go to find the, the origination of this, this pattern. Now, sometimes the answer might be, oh, it actually started the day before. Had a client the other day who like became very acutely aware of this for the first time because he started doing this uh, and, and basically found that, well, his execution was really, really good. Let's say it was a, a, a Tuesday, really, really good, but he didn't make any money. It was like, damn, like execution was great. Process was great. I made some improvements there, feeling really good, and yet kind of a little deflated because I didn't make money. And then the next day, there was a bit more urgency. And so right out of the gate, kind of like one of the examples here, a little hasty, a little nervousness, like you're trying to make something happen. And so the early signal is actually coming from the day before, right? Understanding the full scope of your pattern becomes your way to take action on Tuesday night, not Wednesday morning, or maybe Wednesday morning pre-market, right, as a way of avoiding this, right? You can start to deal with it. But bottom line is like the earlier you are able to identify those signals, right? The more you can take action before the problem has actually occurred. All right. Uh, for some of you, especially if you're scalping or you're taking a lot of trades in a day, right? You just get sort of so engrossed by the market. You just do not have the ability to do what I'm asking, right? And kind of take that step back and take the notes. And so you actually have to be purposefully disruptive. So you set an alarm, set a timer to go off at some frequency throughout the day. And at that time, you just take a step back 30 seconds. Doesn't have to take a lot of time. Write down what you're experiencing or write down maybe what's going on more recently. Try to get a sense of how your emotions are kind of oscillating up and down or if you're stable and, and perhaps why. Uh, number three, uh, meditation or mindfulness training. I'm not a massive proponent on either of those two things, in part because I think they're often oversold as a solution. In my mind, they are best served as a tool to build the awareness, self-reflection, the internal ability to sense your own patterning. And so, yeah, they are great tools for that. If you're, you tend to be one of those that maybe is a bit more blind, uh, you could consider doing uh, either of those two things. Uh, and lastly, uh, understand the intensification of emotion. Basically what that means is, or many of you think of, of frustration and anger as being two different things when frustration is just a smaller version of anger, right? Frustration builds, eventually turns into anger. Anger eventually turns into rage, okay? Fear, right? Fear is really comes down to like nervousness, antsiness, a little bit of, of like kind of tension. And then fear can turn into like a phobia or a panic, right? Every emotion has a scale to it, okay? And that's ultimately what we're going to do now is take the data that you've collected and turn it into a map where you're charting the intensification of those emotions. And that becomes really, really critical to consistently kind of nailing this first step of the system uh, where you can see before the problem right, occurs when your emotions are still small. Because if you're going to do that step three of correcting your problem, Again, we need mental faculties to, to, do, to use that, right? Emotional control, right? And, and that the part of the brain needs to be strong enough in order to have some impact. If your emotions rise too high, right? You, you can't do that, right? Even using my system, right? We've got to work within this parameter. So catching the early signs is so critical because you do have kind of full mental capacity and, you know, you're kind of tilting the scales of, uh, of, of probability of success here kind of in your favor. And that's really what you're after. Okay. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to take the data you've gathered, right? So basically do the data collection for, you know, a couple of days, maybe a week, uh, ideally, right. You could go back kind of retroactively to maybe mistakes that you've made this past week or others that you've made that are very well known, right? You don't have to start with from scratch here, but what you're going to then do is put them into order, uh, uh based on severity. Okay. So here's what this looks like. 
this is a map of greed. Now we're using all of the data that you've collected, right? All the examples, and we're just sort of split it in half. You don't have to do this. It just becomes a way of maybe kind of segmenting things a little bit, right? On one side, you're kind of putting all the mental, emotional, physical, action-oriented stuff. And then the other side is more of the kind of technical data uh, that, that's more kind of, again, kind of trading oriented. Okay. And we're doing it on a scale of one to 10, right? One being the most basic level of, in this case, greed that you could identify all the way down to level 10. Okay? And I'm going to give you some examples so you can uh, kind of understand uh, what this looks like. Okay. So uh, now this comes from the mental game of trading. This is uh, from a, a real example. Uh, so at level one, this client started thinking about the utility of money wanting to lock up the game, wanting to have that big trade to secure the profit and achieve better returns to see progress, right? And at this stage, right, there was actually no technical mistakes that are occurring here. This is a very kind of sophisticated sense that there's, this greed has popped up, right? And, and this came, I think probably about two weeks in, right? So we had, had our first session. This was this first uh, attempt at a, at, a, at a map of greed based on the data that was collected. Now what you can see here, right, there's a gap, right? Between level two and level four, there's just nothing here, and that's fine. Especially in the early stages, you're you're going to have these big holes. But as you work on this, eventually you're going to kind of capture more of the data. Uh, all right, so a level five, you know, wonder if I should move my profit target really close. I could secure it now, but I could move the target farther away if I push the trade farther. I'll be secure for longer. Okay, let me jump to number ten. Number ten is highest level of greed. You know, I want to make the absolute best returns right now. Give up all control. Uh, I'm going to only focus on making money right now, and there's no longer term thinking. Okay. Now, after another two weeks, this is what happened. Okay. Able to fill in all those holes. And what we see is there's a new number one. Now, the first sign of greed was logging into my brokerage account to have a brief look at PL. Okay. So, this took about a month of time to create, going from the data collection to the first draft to now this draft. Okay. Now, Here's another example. This came from uh, actually the trading masterclass, a couple other examples just to show you, but like this is an example of a very kind of basic first draft, right? There's no fear at all, feeling very super confident in myself, cool, right? Level five, begin to second guess my entries, afraid to increase my exposure, doubting my process. Level 10, feeling temp terrible, confidence stumbled, right? Paralyzed and tend to depress myself, play video games to avoid reality, okay? now. Here's another map, and I want to kind of show you this one just because I love the color coding of this, just to provide another, you know, bit of perspective here. And this is for anger. Okay, you know, just for time's sake, I'm just going to kind of go through this quickly. But you can see, right, there's still some holes in this, but by and large, there's a clear sense of progression, and that's really what we're after. Now, the other thing we're after for here is, can you identify where that kind of teetering point is for where your emotions are going to cross that line where you can uh, kind of no longer gain control and take action? I never want you to be in a position in the early stages here where you're just going to kind of keep getting run over and succumb to those mistakes because of anger or fear or, or whatever. I want you to be able to kind of shut things down early enough so you can build skill, not just in the system, but in actually controlling your actions. So it is a good thing for you to lock up wins, lock up a successful day early on to build that competency. For some of you, this is a bit like going to, you know, physical therapy where you've just, you know, again, we'll go, let's go back to that broken ankle analogy, right? Ankle's broken, take the cast off, but now you gotta go rehab it, right? First day's a rehab, like you're not gonna just go full on, right? It, you, that's how you're gonna re-injure it, maybe even re-break it, right? And so some of you actually do that. You attempt to, and I say this, some of you mean like some of the clients and some of the people in the master class like have done this where, in the early days, you're just kind of pushing yourself too hard, too fast. When you are trying to build a system here that's going to work, it's a lot like building muscle. It's a lot like rehabbing where you've got to do it progressively. If you try to go too fast, you're going to regress and you're going to kind of undercut yourself. And I don't want you to lose faith in the strategy or the system because it will work if you put in the time. And if it doesn't work, there are clear reasons for that. Okay. But again, this sort of sense of progression here. Uh, one last one just to show you. Uh, a, a version of a, a map of confidence. Uh, here you'll see uh, there's an optimal level at level five, right? And so then like four to one is progressively getting worse in terms of confidence, right? All the way down to like the worst confidence at level one. 
and then progressively more confidence, like leading to extreme overconfidence uh, at level 10. Okay. The bottom line is, regardless of what emotion that you're dealing with, you can map it in this way. And that map effectively becomes kind of like your indicators in real time where you sense opportunity in the market. Now you've got mental game, emotional indicators that provide you a sense of reflection for yourself in the moment that can tell you where you stand, right? You know, you're kind of like a slot machine. You're just like a human slot machine, right? You've got your edge that you're trying to extract from the market. But if you are a human slot machine that suddenly now <laughs> that slot machine is now paying out more than it's taking in, my God, you got to know that, right? The casino needs to know that they've got to pull that slot machine off the floor right now. You need to know the same thing. And that is what this first step of mapping your pattern is really all about. And so if you're gonna do that, I suggest going to my website. Okay, you can see here in top right corner, uh, under resources, uh, this worksheet tab, free downloadable worksheets. There's lots of resources, including something called an A to C game analysis, which will help you to break out of that kind of excessively p &L focused, right? Remember what I said before, those of you who are overly focused on results, a to C game analysis is your best friend. It's a very simple concept. Just download it. Um, right. And so, yeah, worksheets, great way to get started. If you want more mental game of trading, uh, you know, it's very much available everywhere. I think uh, the guys from Trader Line are going to drop the link into the chat. Uh, audio, you know, it's on Audible. Traders love the audio book, um, you know, Kindle, pretty much anywhere that you read and consume books, uh, it's available there. Uh, like I said before, uh, the trading masterclass with Trader Line. It's a five part series. It dramatically expands with a lot of examples, a lot of stories, a lot of questions of kind of troubleshooting uh, and effectively kind of creating a system for you that you can use really for the entirety of your trading career. Uh, and for those of you that want more, you know, kind of on I me, mean, you can see in this, this drop down here, right? There's a free intuition ebook you can download. Uh, I also host a monthly office hours. Uh, one's going to happen next week. Uh, where I basically just answer questions on YouTube. Uh, so you're freely welcome to do that. Um, and I'm fully supportive of uh, Trader Lion's efforts to uh, help out St. Jude here. So um, Rich, maybe you can kind of nail down the exact specifics of how we're going to do this. But basically anybody that donates $100 to St. Jude, I will personally send you a free copy uh, of the Mental Game of Poker, uh, sorry, <laughs> Mental Game of Trading uh, signed by me. Uh, just make sure you, uh, I think, give out your full name so we know who is who and, but I'm happy to do that and supporting the efforts here. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it I got for, for you all. Uh, appreciate you being here early on a Saturday or late on a Saturday and certainly working hard and putting the uh, effort into improving your trading skills, knowing that the mental game, right, and trading psychology is so important to actually do that. Perfect. Jared, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. And to anybody who wants to take Jared up on that uh, and win a signed copy, uh, yeah, just make sure that your donation is not anonymous and I'll make sure to write down anybody's name who pops up here. So um, Jared, thank you so much. I, I think this is a topic that, like you said, a lot of people are aware of that it's important, but there isn't necessarily that system. They don't have that system in place uh, to deal with it. So I think that's super, super important, super important concepts you went over. Um, and to hear you off the Q&A before people drop their questions in the chat, which definitely go ahead and do so. Um, I want to talk to you about, you know, how, how much, uh, what, what level of emotions is a good thing, right? Because to some extent, emotions can drive us, you know, Michael Jordan really thrived off emotions that allowed him to reach another level of performance. So um, obviously too much can impact our ability to trade and make proper decisions. Uh, but where, how do we, how can we kind of find that balance? I, th I think that's a good question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so I'm gonna actually going to pull up a, a graphic here um, that will kind of help to reinforce what I'm saying. Um, but basically the premise is like being emotionless, being robotic is like not really the end outcome that we want, right? You want to understand, right, the kind of right formula of emotions that is going to kind of fuel you to be at your best, right? And, and the bottom line is like you do need emotion to power that, right? Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, Right. The elite athletes of the world, frankly, like the elite traders of the world, they're not numb and robotic uh, when they're operating at a high level. Right. They are kind of full of emotion. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of show this from uh, the mental game of trading. Right. Um, this is called uh, the York Stotson law. So what you can see here right at the top of the curve, right, this is kind of describing the relationship between performance and stress. And 
you know, you can see like in that kind of bottom left corner, right? That's when your emotions are too low, right? You're tired, you're lazy, you're bored, or you're just not, you're just a little flat, right? And this actually is kind of where the discipline issues would kind of be most defined would be on that, uh, sorry, the left side of the curve, the left side of the curve where your emotions are too low. The right side of the curve is where your emotions are too high, right? And so the, the, the real goal is to drive your emotions to the top of the curve. And to do that sometimes means really being connected to your goals day to day and using that motivation as the primary driver for you, right? For what you're trying to accomplish day to day. But at the end of the day, right? If you spend some time and think about uh, you know, what is it like when you are at your best, right? We can kind of do this pattern recognition for your problems, but you can do the exact same thing for when you're at your best and you kind of naturally have, you know, that optimal energy right at the center of that curve. Um, now, to do that and then kind of figure out how to produce it is two different things. So you eventually, once you kind of recognize, you know, what's, what, what are the characteristics? Like, what, what are the things you're thinking about? What, is your, what are your routines like? Right. You can create some predictability around it. It is very challenging to do. Uh, it's not impossible, but it just takes work like really like anything else. Perfect. And there's a question earlier in the chat about, you know, how you actually went, went around um, creating the system. So can you talk a little bit about your background and how you went, obviously, from a really great amateur pro, a golfer uh, to, you know, uh, learning the system and, and teaching it as well? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, 1997, I wanted to uh, try to qualify for the U.S. Open. Uh, I was an amateur at the time. I was, you know, just finishing up my, my freshman year at, uh, at Skidmore College, uh, Division Three. And basically missed getting onto stage two, uh, which is effectively like a, a, a small PG tour event because the US Open, yeah, I think it has like 70 qualifiers, right? So anybody with a low enough handicap can go play. Uh, and, and there's just a number of tour players that have to actually qualify. Uh, so uh, I effectively choked, right? I missed by a shot, missed a bunch of short putts. And so my aspirations of playing professional golf you know, started to kind of get into question in my mind because I was not able to both in that tournament and then in successive tournaments kind of get over the hump. So um, I kind of dove into sports psychology, dove into golf psychology, looking for answers. And my game did progressively get better. Uh, but at a certain point, you realize like I, I, the gap was too great and I was continuing to kind of fail. So I, I sort of decided to get a master's degree in counseling psychology, basically get trained to be a therapist, not because I wanted to be a shrink, but because I wanted to combine the problem solving ability of a therapist with the tools and techniques that I had found from sports psychology. And effectively in 2005, after getting my, my master's degree, getting licensed as a therapist, right. I actually technically could be a licensed therapist or a, a, a practicing therapist, but I wanted to combine those two things to kind of bridge the gap between what I saw was missing from sports psychology uh, and golf psychology and combine it into a, a, a more robust program. So in 2005, began doing that with golfers, eventually met a poker player uh, on the golf course. Uh, and that uh, then kind of transitioned in this huge opportunity uh, within, within poker, wrote the mental game of poker uh, one and two. In 2013, uh, traders started picking up the poker book, you know, kind of seeing how much it applied to them. And, and writing the, 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 the poker book was really kind of the first iteration of the system. Uh, but then over the next, you know, eight years before I started writing the mental game of trading, I had learned a lot. And so the mental game of trading really kind of expands and systematizes my system, you know, in a lot more precise detail. And so the bottom line is it's a, just a byproduct of my education, my experience, uh, you know, as a high level golfer, uh, you know, who is still competing to this day, right. I tried qualifying for the U S open again this year, this year I was three shots off that, that qualifying, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just getting back into it after having a family and, you know, work and all the rest of it. But um and so I kind of really systematizing it you know, as, as a player, uh, as, as, you know, through my education and then through my experience, I've worked with thousands of clients in a variety of different fields. And it's just kind of like, you just kind of figure out what works. And because it's important to me to like, I, I can, there's only like so many hours I can work with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. So for me, writing the books was a, an opportunity and doing the masterclass and doing presentations like this is really about helping more people at once. And so I'm kind of forced to systematize it in a way in order to accomplish that main goal uh, and not kind of be like everybody else. And the other thing is that when I went into poker, I couldn't kind of bullshit that audience. I mean, you're talking about like sophisticated people who are, you know, kind of uh, 
whose brains are designed to spot out bluffs and spot out people who are full of it. So it was, it be kind of, it became more of like, or how can I not just provide a lot of advice, but actually provide them a roadmap, provide them a system that they can use, you know, themselves and kind of use their knowledge. And, and ultimately that's kind of what it's turned into, which has been a lot cooler for me because I don't have to know everything about what it takes to be a great trader. I need to know enough about what you all go through to be able to kind of reflect things back in a way that maybe you hadn't seen them before. But ultimately the system is the system. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool that um, uh, it's it's been so well received over the years by so many different audiences. Excellent. And it looks like uh, Michael Dominguez donated $100. So thank you so much, Mike. Awesome. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure. It off you, Mike. Yep. We'll make sure that gets to you. Uh, there's some great questions coming in as well. So keep those coming. Um, Jared, having worked with so many traders, uh, what are some of the common mental game problems that people deal with? Um, and what are kind of some, some of the solutions? Obviously it's very, um, you know, each thing is, in, is an individual problem, but what are some of the common mistakes that uh, you see a lot of traders go through? I mean, you know, it's kind of across the board, right? You're dealing with, you know, entries and exits, uh, you know, how are you getting in? How are you getting out? I mean, how, like, I think obviously there are lots of reasons to get in prematurely, lots of reasons to not get in at all. Right. And I think the, that's where you're looking. Um, I, I'd say one of the bigger surprises for a lot of traders is just the actual stress of being in a trade, yeah. right? How emotionally volatile it is. And so that often kind of can fatigue you in a way, right? And then you end up kind of uh, taking suboptimal exits uh, as a result of that or moving stops as a result of that. Uh, but, you know, I think the the emotions and the problems that I've described already thus far, I think kind of cover, you know, kind of the big mental game problems mm -hmm. uh, from a trading standpoint. I mean, there's so many different varieties of, of trading, but the, the mistakes are kind of endless. And, and ultimately, right, it, it's kind of up to you to know where you are actually bleeding money. And if you can do that, then you can start to identify the emotions that are helping to drive that. Perfect. And kind of along those lines, exactly what you're talking about. There's a question from Santiago. Um, question for Jared, how can I control anxiety while holding losses? Um, you know, before that stop is triggered, even with small share sizes, it hinders my sleep. I'm checking my PL way too often. Yeah, I, I think the A to C game analysis is really the beginning of that an the antidote, right? The more that you can create this sort of feedback mechanism that is more geared towards execution than it is towards PL. Right, PL is never going to go away as a priority, but when you fully understand that PL is a byproduct of your execution, and if you're not making as much money as you could, yeah, it could be that your system needs to evolve, it needs to adapt. And so, is again, is the anxiety related to that, or is the anxiety related to you defining yourself as a trader and not being able to identify whether you're winning or losing in this game, other than PL? But if you're winning or losing based on execution, and you know that it is profitable. And you know that your execution and your strategy is sort of uh, correctly defined, then that is how you should be measuring yourself day to day, really week over week, right? Month over month, yeah, okay, we're going to start to get a little bit more PL focus, but you can all can have kind of bad months with your execution being pretty good. I mean, it's rare that you're going to have like kind of a perfect execution month and have your PL be awful. So, but by and large, right, when PL is you know, you're having going through these, these drawdowns, it, be, it weighs so heavily on your execution that you end up kind of shooting yourself in the foot in a lot of instances. So yeah, I, I, again, I think the key is how do you define how you're doing, right? Because if you're playing basketball, you're playing golf, you're in these sports, right? You're basing, you know, your sense of the game flow and how you're doing based on your results. You know, poker players struggle with this. Again, golfers struggle with this too. I've had, you know, some of my, my PGA Tour players come off the golf course shooting 74 going, oh my God, I could not have gotten more bad luck. I actually feel pretty good. Did I play great? No, but no way did I play as badly as I did. And then on the flip side, they shoot 66 and they actually are not aware of how much good luck they got in their favor. And, and so, you know, like what's more important, right? Accurate perception or p &L. In the short term, it's accurate perception. In the long term, no. We're not going to be deluded here in thinking that you can make money. I'm sorry, that you can not make money and somehow it's all about execution. It's like, no, it's both kind of yin and yang sort of situation. They both matter. It's just about time frame with which you're emphasizing, you know, one versus the other. 
Perfect. And we've got another person who just donated $100. So thank you so much. Uh, awesome. Make sure uh, to shoot me a DM um, on Twitter and I'll, we'll make sure to hook that up. Um, and Jared, I think this is an important question. How can traders and investors as well uh, differentiate between a problem that's, you know, mental game related versus just, you know, something with their trading system that they need to work on? How can they kind of make that distinction? Yeah, I think the easiest way is, again, kind of the repetitive nature of it, right? And mm -hmm. and the, like, if you kind of know that you shouldn't do it, right? If you know that you shouldn't make that mistake, then, and you can't stop it 100%, like, there's no question it is mental and emotional. If you're making repetitive mistakes, then yes, it could be something with your system. And, and I'm a firm believer that you should check that out first. I mean, you can do both at the same time, roughly, but I mean, my system works a lot better when you know clearly kind of what your system and strategy is and can kind of gauge, again, where those biases, where those flaws, where you're imprinting into the market, uh, you know, some sort of misperception uh, and you can define that, you can identify it. So, I mean, if you're not 100% sure, you certainly can kind of jump into my system because sometimes you'll, be, you'll become more aware of, you know, some of the technical gaps in your strategy. And that happens to a lot of my clients very often. So, and certainly, you know, we saw that in the masterclass, right? People coming back saying, oh my God, I realize how many holes there are because the mental game can kind of maybe excuse it, right? Sometimes, right? You can maybe jump too far into this point. I mean, I, a lot of people think, right? Trading is mostly mental and emotional. And it's like, no, it's both. And it depends on what's where you are in your, your evolution Trading, as a trader. Right. And so we don't discount either, you know, system strategy, mental game, psychology, they both matter. Again, kind of like the PL thing, it's just a question of timing and time frame and when you're thinking about it in terms of your career. 100 percent right, ideal way to start as a trader, right? Do both. Right? You can learn both. But if you're going to start in a, as a newer trader, more of the mental and emotional stuff you're going to be thinking about is going to kind of come from outside of trading, right? You're too new to really understand where those flaws and biases are. So you can kind of learn how to develop a good system and maybe learn how to correct problems that exist in other performance environments that you uh, encounter. Uh, but as you get kind of farther along, the, the distinguishing features of what's mental and what's technical should get a bit clearer for you. Perfect. And there's a question here that I think is pretty good. Uh, thanks, Jared. Great presentation. At the moment of high emotion, fear, anger, greed, et cetera, what are some techniques to use to control slash manage uh, besides journaling the emotion and thoughts? Yeah, so again, uh, there's a lot more detail in this in the book and in the masterclass, but the basic parameters here follow this. Number one, your job is to recognize that pattern in real time. So once you've created the map, your job is to actually study it and internalize it so you know it like the back of your hands, so you can see right? The escalation of emotion early and quickly, and you need to take action early and quickly. If you are unable to, your strategy needs to be more dramatic to kind of pull you out of that moment to disrupt that emotion. But that is the second step is disrupting that pattern, right? And if, if you catch it early, the disruption could be as simple as like, just kind of leaning back and taking a deep breath, right? If you can't, if you don't catch it until the emotion is really big, the disruption is going to be like, get the F up and walk out and go for a walk and take 15, 20 minutes to kind of get yourself back. Cause otherwise you're just going to be here. Right. And you know, kind of too glued and going to make a mistake. Once you've kind of disrupted that pattern, uh, the third step here is to do what I call is injecting logic. Now injecting logic is kind of a fancy term for thinking, but it's more of a, of a strategy, more of a tool because you're predetermining the thought. Right. So you're defining it right, very clearly. And ideally, that thought is correcting the root cause of what is actually happening. Right. So if it is expecting perfection or the illusion of control or expecting to make money or hating mistakes, right, that you're actually using a particular piece of logic that you have learned and you've trained that goes to the core of what's causing those flaws. Right. And, or those flaws themselves. And that's what you're injecting at the moment. And then the fourth step. Uh, is to use what I call as a strategic reminder where you are uh, reminding yourself of some of the technical aspects of your system, the indicators that may go missing in that moment, or the key ways in which you're deciding uh, or making decisions or getting back to kind of the game plan at the beginning of the day. Right? But there, the, the basic idea is that when you recognize the emotional volatility, right, you disrupt that momentum, you try to correct it. And once you've kind of 
brought your emotion down a little bit, that does not automatically mean you're going to make a better decision. And so then we kind of bring in some of that trading knowledge that might kind of be a little bit fuzzy or disappear so that in the moment you can just make a better decision, right? Whether it means just to hold or get out or get in. Uh, and that's the, that's kind of the basic parameters of it. But the, the how you actually make that really robust uh, is going to take some time and some work based off of you know your knowledge of the system. Perfect. And you mentioned previously the A to C, Miguel, uh, a to C game analysis. Um, and, uh, you know, that's my favorite topic to ask you about, Jared, the, the interim concept. So uh, maybe just a, a brief description of what that is and, and maybe some resources for people to learn more about that. No, yeah, of course. So again, uh, the uh, the interim concept, the A to C game analysis, basically, uh, I'm going to try to pull up a, a, a graphic of it so everybody can see what it looks like. But yeah, basically, the A to C game, C game analysis um, is... Uh, trying to define your A game, your B game, and your C game, right? Kind of like looking at it from an athletic standpoint where you're kind of chopping up your game in that regard. Um, and you're trying to kind of define the differences uh, both kind of mentally and tactically. And so we're kind of like, this is a different version of the map that I've, I've kind of mentioned already where you're sort of mapping one emotion. This is more of kind of like an aggregate where you're capturing all of what it means for you to be at your best, uh, you know, your average, uh, you know, in the, uh, you know, kind of the B game and then at your worst in terms of C game. All right. And so uh, this is uh, what an interim looks like. Uh, those of you have, have seen one before. Uh, and basically these guys walk like kind of the front end kind of moves forward and then the back end moves forward. The problem for a lot of traders is that like that front end has moved forward a lot, but the back end hasn't moved. Right. And so you think about how good you are when you're at your best versus how bad you are when you're at your worst. Right. This is really, really important to kind of unlock that back end is really a function of uh, the mental and emotional function, right? And, and how uh, severe those problems are. Uh, and so once you're able to do that uh, and kind of define it, right, here is uh, what this A to C game analysis can look like, right? So, you know, A game, very relaxed, decisive, patient, confident, trusting gut, right? B game, a little bit of overthinking, uh, attention on wrong markets, losing focus, missing obvious trades, starting to focus more on PL, right? And then C game is now distracted, risk averse, no patience, negative self talk, self doubt, right? And then here's, you know, kind of what it looks like from a, a technical standpoint. And so, again, can you use this as like a real time form of feedback from a mapping standpoint? Yes, but it's a bit imprecise for my taste. Mm -hmm. This is better as a tool for reflection on your execution as a more basic like way of grading your performance. Were you in your A game, B game, or C game? It can be at the end of the trading day. It can be in the middle of the trading day. But the bottom line is like, you need that feedback. If you don't get it from this, it's going to come from PL. And we know what happens when you're overly focused on PL. It's not a great measure of how you're actually performing. And so, yeah, again, you can go, go back to uh, my website here, uh, you know, download the worksheets, right? It's, a, but again, it's kind of a basic parameter. It's not, not, Kind of overly complicated and that's how i like a lot of things to work right we don't want to make things too hard this this game is already hard hard enough as it is let's just try to uh, uh you know provide a little kind of basic parameters for how to actually improve here and uh and then then it comes down to doing the work like i said before right i, I can kind of give you food i can give you water but you got to drink you got to eat and can you drink water and eat food for a month hell no you got to put the work in consistently, right? In order to actually be able to reshape your perspective, right? And develop the skills necessary to actually be able to solve these problems at a deep level. And so if I've done my job well, then I've made that process a lot easier for you all, right? Whether it's the book, whether it's this, whether it's the masterclass, right? That's what it's designed, but it never should be automatic. I mean, I promise you, if I had the magic pill, right? It would cost a lot more, and then, then I'm selling it for. So you got to put the work in. And at the bottom line is like, you want to, you want to be able to like get on the other side of this. You want to become the kind of trader you want to be from your own work. Yeah, of course the money is great, but uh, the self-satisfaction, right? I, I've worked with a lot of mi miserable people that are worth a lot of money. Right. And it's, the money is not going to make you satisfied in the long run. Right. When, when you develop skills at a deep level, Right. There's something very tangible and powerful about that for your for you, right? That will expand not just within trading, but throughout the rest of your life. And so yeah.
bottom line is do the work. There's no other way around it. And there shouldn't be any other way around it. That's, that's how it should be at the end of the day. Perfect. And I think we've got uh, time for maybe one last question here, Jared. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of intuition. I see the intuition ebook that you're giving away for free on your website that people can check out. Uh, what are your thoughts on intuition and how can kind of traders work to, to build that up as they gain experience? Yeah. So I think intuition um, can be a very kind of confusing point to a lot of traders. Um, the book goes into a lot more detail, obviously, or the ebook does. And it really is kind of a companion piece to the mental game of trading. Uh, one of those topics that I wish I could kind of include, but it just didn't really fit anywhere. Uh, bottom line is, uh, when you have instances where you can feel that kind of intuition, that gut instinct kind of coming up, but you don't go with it, I would still suggest kind of writing down kind of what you saw in those moments, because they usually include some elements that are not very well known, right? There's some kind of intuition that's picking up on new tales, right? There's Because if it was already systematized, it would be part of your B game or your C game, right? There's something new here that you're seeing. So intuition really is your mind's ability to kind of grab this very subtle data and convert it into some sense of what's right in this moment. Mm -hmm. And because you can't fully articulate it, it becomes harder to trust. But if you take some time to define what that is and really understand how it fits with your strategy, right? Then, um, you know, you can start to make use of it a lot more. I, I, I kind of often use the analogy of like, if, if intuition or your gut feels like a stranger, right? You don't really know what it is or what it's based on and who it is. Like, of course, you're not going to trust it. You wouldn't, you know, walk down the street and just like ask some random trader, like what you should do with your, your uh, Tesla position. Like <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, right? Instead, you know, you want to become more familiar, make, become friends uh, with that intuition. And, you know, in order to do that, uh, you've got to study it much like a lot of other things. And, you know, that, that ebook that you can download, you know, goes into a bit more theory in terms of like where that unconscious data comes from. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you can write more about it, understand more about what's going on, uh, your ability to utilize your intuition will get a lot better. And more importantly, your ability to distinguish from the fake intuition will become a lot greater too, because all of the emotions that I've talked about today they can connive you. They can manipulate your mind into thinking, right, that the FOMO is justified. It's not, no, no, this isn't FOMO. No, this is a legitimate opportunity. No, 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 this isn't revenge trading. No, no, there's a legitimate opportunity here, right? Those emotions can kind of masquerade as intuition. And if you can't spot the differences, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to, you're going to lose uh, quite a lot more and go through more pain. But again, Right. Writing and tracking and detailing become your way of, of you know, ultimately profiting more. Perfect. Well, Jared, thank you so much for your time and for kicking things off today on day three. I think everybody watching really enjoyed it. Um, I'd highly recommend to everybody to go check out Jared's book. We pasted the link a few times in the chat. And I'll also paste right now the masterclass we just did earlier this year, which I think really, if you have any questions about training psychology um, and f about Jared's system, we go into that. We have so many examples, so many, you know, live workshops with students who are, are just, you know, in the same same boat that you guys are in. Uh, so definitely check that out. Um, and Jared, thank you so much for your time once again. And um, yeah, thanks so much.